five people first. I'd like to thank everyone for the hospitality of the past two years. Haven't seen you very often, but it has been very interesting for me and fun when I did. So thank you for attending this talk, which is the result of a large part of what I did during my time as an OFI affiliate. And uh, uh, so without further ado, here we go with uh, prepositions. So I'm, oh, and I must, sorry, I need to share my screen. Um, am I sharing the correct screen? I believe so, yes. Perfect, thank you. That's good. So I'm going to briefly explain something about the situation of Arabic, its diffusion, how it's articulated in different Arabics. I will then move on to discuss language variation, the comparative method, what has been framed as the Humboldt's problem, then I'm diving in into my favorite preposition fee and discuss a couple of issues that I've been uh, analyzing during this project, which by the way is titled Functional Diversification and Linguistic Relatedness, a study of the distribution of P across Arabic varieties. And you'll see why in a little while. So why is it? Okay. Uh, Arabic or Arabics? There is a confusion among what Arabic is, uh, because Arabic refers to many different things. There is a reconstructed language, that which is said to be proto-Arabic, that is the equivalent of, let's say, on a genetic level of what Indo-European is. Then there is something that probably you've heard about, which is classical Arabic, which is a literary language, which has been used to write poetry and is the language that also is used for the composition of the Quran. And then uh, there is what is called the modern standard Arabic, which is a language that has been coined from classical Arabic. It is used by the media, so the, by the journalists in the Arab world, and is the variety that is generally taught in Western universities. And then there are these things that are called Arabic dialects, or variety of Arabic, or spoken Arabic, and that is what we are interested in with this project. Uh, with um, They are the first language, so the L1, the native language of most virtually all Arabic speakers, since classical Arabic is the variety that is learned in school. Um, why do we have Arabics? Well, as we know, their languages change over time. We can assume that the features of a, of a language should be completely transmitted from one generation to the next. But this condition almost never happens because there is always some factor that intervenes, creating a dispersion of languages that resemble each other but have slightly different features. There are many factors that contribute to this kind of diversification. One type of factors are like linguistic internals, and that is an, in uh, an interesting question per se. So what are the features that tend to evolve from one to the next uh, within a language? It's hardly predictable. We try to investigate it, but it's hard to define. So that's just to tell you that there is this open question and there are other factors that are more, no more well known called extra linguistic factors, depending for instance, on the number of speakers that you have in a community, on the degree of multilingualism that you have in that community, and the degree of contact that you have from one language to the next. Uh, for instance, a variety that is spoken close to the border with a place where another language is spoken, the prestige relationships between languages and social classes, etc. All these factors together make ling languages progressively become more different. So Arabic dialects are can be seen in this perspective as the different daughters of an original mother language, which thanks to all these factors, contact, time, have evolved into different things, different varieties, 
a question that remains open is whose daughters are they? This is different to identify, difficult to identify the uh, common relative, whether there's only one common relative or more common relative. And so how do we group them? Are they all equally similar or are, should they be grouped and then divided into subgroups until we get to the single varieties? And this is an open question. I would say that is the main, one of the most debated questions in Arabic dialectology. And this is the context in which my research is framed. So brief history of Arabic, just to give you an idea of how complex the thing is. Well, there was, one region where Arabic was originated, well, let's call it the pre-diaspora Arabic, that is the Arabic Peninsula. And then at one point there was the Islamization of Arabization of a great part of the known world at the time, so that by 1711, Spain had been become an Arabic speaking area, actually, was becoming an Arabic speaking Arabic area. And so was also Uzbekistan on the opposite side. So what you see in the map in color is now the widest extension that uh, the Arabic speaking region had gained throughout history. And for the next 1000 years, there were internal migrations within this area which complicated additionally the landscape. And that led to a very uh, high degree of differentiations in the different regions. So that's why reconstructing how these languages are, are now grouped, considering the different substrata, the brief time that they needed to spread for this great extension, um, those are all factors that contributed to the differentiation of the Arabic varieties. Currently, there is a generic uh, split of Arabic varieties into five different macro areas with a certain level of uncertitude. So there is this wide region of the Maghreb area that essentially covers the entire North African region. There is Egyptian Arabic, Levantine Arabic, this is the area of the uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Syria, and Palestine. And then there is Iraqi Arabic and the Gulf region, with, as you can see, Sudan or Mauritania and other regions that are uh, Yemen that are uh, still like somehow vaguely um, categorized as belonging to one or the other. Um, this type of, it should be said that this type of classification is essentially based, or it's often based on um, morphological, so grammatical morpheme differentiation, comparison between grammatical morphemes, lexical items, and phonology. Uh, this is the classical um, approach that the comparative method in linguistics has. It was introduced in the 18. 70s, it focuses on the reconstruction of an earlier language on the basis of comparisons of related words, their sounds or expressions. And I mean, if you think that Darwin lived between 1909 and, and 1882, you can see that there is a parallel in this effort of reconstructing uh, uh, animal evolution or life, the evolution of life and uh, uh, the evolution of a language. So that is the philosophical or theoretical um, field that has been integrated in linguistics. Um, so we can apply this approach, this traditional approach referred to as lexical statistics to Arabic varieties. And uh, this is, for instance, what uh, it was done in the fine grade Arabic DID that stands for dialectal identification. So in this work, whose final aim is not the reconstruction of the genealogy, or, but the creation of a model which would predict based on, lex based on lexical items, the different dialects in to which a specific test would fall in. So this is a model that has been designed for predicting uh, the um, 
bel- to which uh, variety uh, uh, tax belongs. So the but they also created uh, reconstructed the uh, a dendrogram of the structure of Arabic dialects for the purpose of evaluating the complexity of their, of their task. So I'm going to refer to this first part of the study. So what they did in their method is collecting a large number of parallel sentences covering uh, the dialects of 25 different cities in the Arabic speaking area. Then they calculated the lexical similarity between the lexical Uh, between the the dialects of the two cities. So they had a small corpus of 2,000 sentences for each dialect, and then they compared the percentage of lexical similarity for every two cities, so counted as common tokens in between or across the different, uh, the pairs of um, corpora, And then they apply the hierarchical agglomerative clustering algorithm to the similarity matrix, which grouped clusters using the single linkage clustering and created a a dendrogram out of that. And this is what the dendrogram looks like. So they have the uh, 25 varieties plus MSA, so modern standard Arabic, And uh, the first branch starting on the left corresponds to Iraqi, then there is Libyan, Yemeni, uh, there is the Arabic Peninsula with Doha Jadariyad, there is Tunisia, Algeria, Moroccan, um, Sudanese, and then um, Egyptian, Moroccan, and the Middle East. Um, the, sorry, I said the Moroccan I meant Syria and Jordan and the Middle East. Um, for their own admission here, what they were able to spot with this dendrogram is the similarity between languages that are geographically similar, uh, geographically uh, near, so that uh, at least at the lower level of the dendrogram, the pairs and the triplets are always formed by cities that often belong to the same uh, country or to bordering nations. Meaning that this study tends to reproduce a property of the lexicon, which is the transferring of lexical items across um, nearing regions. In fact, this traditional comparative method has several limitations. And with respect to this study, it has the limitation refer, um, related precisely to this surface, surfacey property of language, which is the lexicon. Because even core vocabulary item can be uh, replaced. So even words that are highly common may sometimes be subject of replacement with languages of a neighboring, from a neighboring uh, language, from a neighboring region, meaning that we don't have any certainty of how deep we probe when we're studying deep in terms of time when we study the lexicon of a language. So for instance, we can have two languages that have a very high percentage of shared vocabulary but they're still less closely related related to one another than that percentage would suggest. This is, for instance, the case of English and French, which are respectively a Germanic and uh, Romance language, but due to, to, to their history, they have a high uh, level of words in common. It is said that English has up to 50% of vocabulary items that are from Roman origins. So it has been proposed that we should use more substantial uh, properties of language to explore language genealogy in order to be able to probe further through time. And uh, um, the analogy that Longobardi and Guardiano propose is just like phylogenetic classification, which is based nowadays on molecular biology, is able to 
tell us the most ancient relations among populations. On the same way, a language classification which is based on syntactic properties should be able to tell us something that is uh, more accurate or depict a previous or, or most more ancient stage of the language of or relations between language that the simple lexical evidence can propose. What they do in their work, Longobardi and Guardiano, they use principle and the principle and parameters theory, which is a theoretical proposal uh, put forward by Chomsky in the 80s, which says that syntax has some specific points of variation and that these uh, points of variation are universal and every language every natural language is articulated as shutting off or better acquiring or not acquiring uh, a list of predefined properties. So this would allow to, pro to produce classifications that are similar to the biological ones, which are based on ex not on externally accessible evidence, which is not very reliable, but something that can be compared to the molec molecular level because the former type of evidence, so the, bio, uh, the external accessible, the morphological properties tend to be unstable through time. They are dependent on the environment and they are pressured by natural selection, just like the factors for language change that we've seen at the beginning. So the pressure with other communities may produce, may result more easily in a shift in the lexicon rather than in the shift of a more uh, subjacent and fundamental syntactic property. And uh, they uh, framed it as the Humboldt's, the Humboldt's problem based on the idea uh, that Humboldt propose the distinction between different uh, analysis of language. And the problem is framed as such, are syntactic and lexical classification of language isomorphic? Or, and the possible answer is that they provide, the two levels provide similar taxonomic results, or that syntax provides a taxonomic result which is at odd with that of the lexicon. So based on this approach that uh, they, the two authors put forward, I try to redesign the genealogy or the, the similarity relations between Arabic varieties based on uh, syntactic and to a small extent lexical properties together. So this is when we are finally discussing prepositions. And uh, the, our case study is the preposition fee. Preposition fee, tiny but powerful, is a great testing ground for various hypotheses related to language because it is omnipresent across dialects. So it allows us to evaluate hypotheses on the genealogical relations among spoken Arabic varieties. And it also allows us to address more fundamental questions on the limits of grammaticalization properties which are involved uh, in the, which involve locative, locative prepositions. For this presentation, I'm just going to focus on this first point. So what I did is selecting 11 varieties that were represented that were representing uh, in a pretty homogeneous way uh, different points of the Arabic speaking region. So I included in my study Algerian, Egyptian, Iraqi, Jordanian, Libyan, Moroccan, Maltese, Sudanese, Syrian, and Yemeni. And uh, it should be sorry, let me close this. And it should be uh, considered that. I'm going to call and use the abbreviations such as you see in the second column in the rest of the talk, but this is really like a fictional representation of the varieties that are spoken in specific cities. 
Uh, the point is that we are talking about varieties that are not standardized, they're not taught in school, and even within every single region, there is there are additional further dialectal splits which should be kept into, into account. And also it should be considered that languages are not often clear cut, right? There is not something that corresponds, I don't know, to Tunisian and to Algerian, but maybe there are varieties spoken in the capitals of the two countries with then varieties that become progressively more similar when we go to the uh, bordering, when we get clear closer to the bordering regions. This does not, uh, it, does not stand, so it is not true for Maltese, which is the only Arabic dialect that has the status of an official language and is taught in school. So instead of relying on dialectal var uh, varieties of Maltese, I interviewed informants asking them to give me judgments, as I will show you in a second, about the standard variety uh, that they were taught. Uh, what is interesting about fee is that there are various possible uses. So 11 different uses that I've been able to identify in the literature, and uh, they serve a pretty large number of semantic and uh, syntactic functions. So in its most, what I would say, basic default meaning, P is a locative preposition that can have either a locative or a temporal meaning, as you can see in one and two. So the pot is in C, your hand, or uh, a temporal one, like at night or during the day. But it can also be used uh, as in tree to precede the subject of a causative sentence, so a causativized verb, when the subjacent verb is a stative verb. That means that we have a stative transitive verb like to like, but if I want to construct a, a, a sentence in Arabic, like I want someone to like something, that something has to be preceded by the preposition fee. Uh, it can also have a possessive use of a very specific type, the, which was identified by Peter. In this use, a uh, fee is used to identify something that belongs to another larger object that is part of it, but has like some sort of identifiable function. So for instance, my computer has fee it, a, blue, a Bluetooth mouse, or it can also be used as in five as an existential, era, uh, existential element. So to introduce an existential question, so the sentence of the type, there is a cat under the chair where there is, is replaced in uh, certain Arabic varieties by the preposition fee. It can be used to license the argument of a, the verbal noun. So a noun that comes from a verb like to educate, the word education, or to destroy the, the noun destruction. If you want to license the, the direct object, so her education of her children, in certain varieties, we can use the preposition fee. Can also be used to license, so to precede the object of a simple progressive sentence, like Sammy is painting his neighbor's house, where in, in certain varieties of Arabic, the house, his neighbor's house, has to be preceded by fee. It can be used in situations in which we have multiple verbs, and the last verb is a verb, uh, is a transitive verb. So, for instance, to go study, if you go study a lesson, as in, in sentence eight, the lesson has to be preceded by fee. It can be sorry, preceded, uh, in, it can be used for a partitive with a partitive function to mean that part of something is affected and not entirely, and not the object is not entirely affected. So for instance, he tampered with some of the registers to express this idea that not all, not all registers were tampered with, you can put fee before the direct object to mean that only some of them were uh, touched by the action, or it can have, or it can be placed again before the direct object of a transitive construction in order to um, express that that uh, 
action is repeated more than once or is being carried out with a particular level of intensity. And finally, there is a model use. So if you want to uh, express modality in a certain varieties of Arabic, you can substitute, no, you can use the preposition fi instead of using a modal verb as it's done in other varieties. Uh, so the methodology of my study. In the first step, I collected all the bibliographic um, sources that mention the use of fi across Arabic varieties. I extracted the relevant examples from this literature and I created a data set. Then I asked a native speaker of Syrian Arabic to help me translating all these uh, examples into Syrian. And I created a data set in which I was, for instance, placing or removing fee from different sentences to control for the use of fee as a variable. And after that, I hired um, other scribes so that were helping me to translate the same set of sentences that were already, that had been translated in Syrian from Syrian to their own varieties. This allowed me to have a 11 homogeneous data set with parallel sentences, whereby the lexical items were uh, those of the targeted variety, but the use of fee might or might not have been as actually used in the targeted varieties, which, which was a, exactly the research question that I was targeting. So how these 11 different uses of fee distribute in the 11 different varieties of Arabic that I showed you before. This is what a segment of the Tunisian data set looked like. The first column has the variables so the conditions that I was controlling. Second column contains the translation into English of the sentence. So the intended meaning of the sentence. Column three has a unique identifier for the um, for each sentence, which is then used in the final database for retrieval. The Arabic script, so the sentence in Arabic in the dialect, so as translated by the scribes, a phon phonological transcription of the sentence and which, which has under the glosses of how that sentence is used. So as you can see, for instance, in these uh, pair of examples, the sentence is the same and its intended meaning is he's, he's painting his neighbor's house. And uh, in sentence 9.1, the object is preceded by fi, so fi dar, fi dar, whereas in sentence two, the fi is omitted. In this sense, the variables, so the presence of fi was controlled. In the second step, I went for an elicitation task, asking judgments to my uh, informants, which were recorded as booleans. So, true or false. So I was asking each informant, can, for instance, sentence 9-1 correspond to in the, the interpretation, his painting his neighbor's house, and they would say, uh, respond either uh, true or false. I went through the entire data set with three informants for each variety, for each informant. I tried to have people from the same city. I didn't always succeed, and I will show you after as I did what I did. I tried to maintain the age gap uh, between informants within a range of 25 years in order to make sure that they were speaking the same variety, because sometimes across generations, as we saw before, there, could, there can be a change in the language. And of course, I excluded those who were scribes that helped me with the composition of the data set from the pool of informants. I paid both my informants and my scribes, thanks to the FNS, in order to be able to 
maintain, uh, to ensure their participation throughout different uh, several sessions. And the interviewed were conducted in person, either in Geneva or in person or occasionally on Zoom. Uh, for the task, I gathered around 170 hours of interviews. I had a total of 44 participants, 33 informants and 11 people who helped me translating, so 11 scribes. And I contacted these people on job portals. I asked colleagues, had acquaintances of colleagues. I asked friends and collect connections of other participants. And that allowed me to reach communities that were quite narrow in terms of age and uh, also uh, origin. Uh, for those who were living abroad, I also uh, ensured that I had lived at least until the end of high school in their country of origin and that they had been scholarized on in one country. This was what I could do in order to ensure there was really targeting one variety. One task contained 166 sentences and I had a total of 50,478 data points, which is precisely 166 for times three informants, time 11 varieties. Uh, I had, for the moment, two kinds of outputs. One is a, a browsable database, which allows you to see uh, the where the variety, well, the different functions that you can see in the image are used on a map. And you can also search the database itself. Uh, and eventually I can show you in the question of, or answer session how it works. And the second output that I have is the representation of the languages, so the 11 different, different varieties of the 32 speakers as language vectors. And I will show you what I mean with that. So the first problem that I wanted to uh, address was related to uh, precisely these um, in inconsistency that I had for certain varieties where I had speakers from different cities because I wasn't able in that case to have people that were all from people that were all from the same community or people that whose age gap was larger than 25 years. And I wanted to see whether that affected in any ways the their judgment. So what I did is I calculated the cosine, cosine similarity to different pairs of speakers. And the cosine similarity is calculated on the entire list. So a vector is composed by the entire 166 zero or one answers where zero stands for false and one stands for true for each informant. So I compare these long vectors uh, corresponding to each speaker between them for every variety. And as you can see, uh, starting now with the numbers in red, which correspond to Moroccan and Sudan, for which I had an age gap that were superior to 45 years, uh, we see that it is does not seem to be particularly relevant, the fact that the speakers had a greater age gap. So in uh, the case of Moroccan, for instance, uh, the speaker number three is the one that had an greater age gap with respect to the other two speakers. And you can see that the degree of similarity with one, for instance, is the highest, where one corresponds to complete identity and zero would correspond to uh, vectors that are completely orthogonal among each other. And uh, the same can be said with respect to the cities. So again, for instance, if we take the case of Tunisian, which is the second value in green, uh, the similarity between one and speaker one and speaker two corresponds to 0.88, which is again 
the highest value, meaning that, for instance, the difference between speaker two and speaker three, it is greater than the difference that each of them, of them have with respect to the other speaker, the one with, that was coming from a different cities. So that suggests or indicates that in both cases, um, the uh, CD and the age did not indicate, uh, did not uh, skewed uh, their uh, judgment to the point that they should be considered as two different varieties. Uh, I also calculated the standard deviation between the different pairs, and we can see that, <laughs> interestingly, uh, Moroccan and Sudanese are the ones that have the highest and the lowest and the highest standard deviation respectively with respect to their uh, uh, to speakers comparison. As for the second problem, I wanted to see how these uh, judgments referring to this single lexical item fee and its specific syntactic use would determine um, genealogy for uh, Arabic, uh, for the Arabic dialects that I um, investigated. So in this case, I collected parallel sentences covering the 11, the dialects of these 11 more or less cities with the exceptions of the two cities that I mentioned before. Uh, I created a speaker profiles, as I said, transforming Boolean values into numerical values where, three and, where true and false were uh, taken to correspond to value one and zero respectively. And as said, the entire list of answers that every speaker gave was considered to be a vector. Then I created a language profile a summing the vectors of the different, the three speakers of the same language. So for instance, a sentence for which three speakers would give a value one would have a value equivalent to three in the language profile. And then I calculated the similarity as an Euclidean distance among every pair of language vectors. I again, just like the, the study showed before, applied a hierarchical agglomerative cluster algorithm to the similarity matrix. And then I had the program clustering uh, the different uh, profiles with a single linkage and created a dendrogram out of it. So, oops. This is the dendrogram that we had from the previous study, the one that they did based on the lexicon. And uh, uh, this is what it corresponds to if we group the varieties, for instance, Iraqi into one branch. So I only took here the branch for the varieties that I had, okay? So it gives us a uh, profile of this kind where, for instance, um, Tunisian, Algerian, and Moroccan correspond to the area in red and purple, with red that is Tunisian and Algerian and Moroccan the shade purple as they belong to the first primordial branching. Uh, same for Jordanian and um, Syrian, which also, which are the one in light yellow, they share the same color as they belong to the same branching, which in this, in their study, are assumed to be closer to the Egyptian and then to Sudanese, whereas Iraqi, Libya, and Yemeni, oddly enough, are grouped together as a separate group, which branch which attach, attaches to the other two groups only at the very later, late stage. Whereas according to my study, adopting the uh, system I showed you before, this is the type of taxonomy that I get where Algerian and Tunisian are the closest instead of getting uh, Tunis Algerian and Moroccan as in the previous one, Egyptian and Yemeni, are uh, closer 
Moroccan seems to be attached to them. Mm. Jordanian and Syrian are again the closest and Iraqi uh, is added at the very last level. I wanted to see if by changing measures, I would get different, what kind of uh, dendrogram I would get. So I also investigated and I had the program drew also dendrograms for complete linkage, which changes a bit the morphology of this tree with the difference that it um, still groups together Tunisian and Algerian, Egyptian and Yemeni, and uh, Jordanian and uh, Syrian. Still, as before, Iraqi is considered to be, to be the most distant uh, variety of all, with uh, Maltese, Moroccan, and Sudanese that are grouped uh, differently. And again, I reproduced the dendrogram again, uh, adopting uh, an average linkage system, having uh, which again leaves out the same varieties as before and groups together the same pairs, but the shape of the total of the final dendrogram is slightly different. So if we want to go give an answer to the Humboldt's problem, well, that's interesting because syntax in this case provides um, a taxonomic uh, result, which is at odds with that of the, of the lexicon. And of course, now the big problem that I have to face is, is this result better? So this is where I'm at now, trying to evaluate first how the different dendrograms that I get are representative of different properties of these data sets that I have. And also, um, what is the advantage of resorting to this categorization of fee, uh, to the kind of categorization of Arabic dialects, which is based on fee instead of being based on uh, uh, lexical items only. Uh, so the next phase will be to test how syntax, which is supposed to be less unstable than the lexicon has more probing potential to uh, evaluate connections through time. Um, so in a similar way to what we said earlier about biology, uh, although syntax is more remote from common sense and observation as genetic markers are, they might be able to reveal us uh, properties or different types of connections which are more substantial and less superficial as morphology is. Of course, here I have a problem which I still have to see how to bypass, which has to do with uh, the small size of the data sets. And uh, because only a sufficiently large set of formally analyzed syntactic properties and also of items has the potential to be a bit better object for this kind of evolutionary investigation of languages than um, uh, the, the classical lexical um, statistic approach has. So thank you so much.